All right, I'd like to thank my next guest, James Hahn, PGA Tour winner, two-time winner. And he's joining me from Napa where they're having the first event of the year. It hasn't been a long enough break for the tour, but James, how are you doing this morning? Doing good, good. Glad to be on the show. Thanks, Gary. I appreciate it. Yeah, definitely great to have you on. Um, so I want to ask you, here we are with the fires going on in, in Northern California. What is that like, air quality? I mean, is it, is it a challenge right now? Um, it is. It's, it's more of a, um, I'd say like a personal challenge. I think some people handle it better than others. Um, I know I played yesterday, was out there for about five hours. Um, and after when I got home, I didn't feel that great when I was there on the golf course. Um, but when I got home, I just felt miserable. You know, you're, you're in smoke, your eyes are burning, um, your nose, I'm, I'm coughing up stuff. And it's just not um, really good for your body. And I think those that are more conscious about it and are aware of how bad the air quality is affects them more than people that just don't know. Um, and so my wife is, was really big. She's been, was texting me throughout the day telling me that I shouldn't spend too much time out there. Um, and so it, it kind of got me thinking and cut my practice a little short. And, uh, you know, even today, my eyes are a little um, sensitive. They're, they're not great. Um, looking at the, the window outside, the, the fog has mixed in with the smoke and it, the sky is very orange. Um, and it doesn't seem like it's a good day to go outside and, and play golf for six hours. So how are you going to manage it once you get to obviously your first round and like, how are you expecting to manage it here? Yeah. Um, I don't know. Um, I might wear a mask while I'm outside, um, to see if that helps at, at all. But, um, and then you have to worry about, uh, like CO2 poisoning, right? Like getting too much, um, or not enough oxygen. And it's just a, a weird, um, kind of world that we live in right now. But, um, you know, uh, it's at the end of the day, other people are competing and, and I love competing more than, um, than not competing, I guess, and uh, putting myself in harm's way, uh, you know, unfortunately might be part of the challenge this week. Well, speaking of competing, as you talk about, like, where are you at right now with your starts? And I know that you had the elbow injury, tricep injury that kind of changed a lot of things with your schedule, but where, where are you at now with kind of your status and what you're going for? Yeah. Um, so let's see. Uh, I started off my medical with 17 starts remaining uh, with about a little over 300 points that I had to earn in order to receive my full exam status. Um, I have played three events, missed all three cuts um, last season and decided to pull the plug and wait until um, the 2020, 21 season. Um, and so, uh, I have 14 starts remaining to make a little over 300 points. Um, and then whatever category I fall into, if I don't reach that, uh, mark, then I would just shuffle in through midway through the year. And how, what is that pressure like in terms of like knowing you got to hit a certain number? And I know your wins, it's been about four years, I think, since your last win, a little over, over four years. So how do you look at the challenge of it as a, as a competitor, as a player? Yeah, no, it's, um, it is a different challenge because you're looking at a different leaderboard, you know? Uh, so you're, at the end of the day, you know, if I don't reach my 300 point goal, I essentially lose my job halfway through the season. Um, and so it is a different challenge. There's a little bit more pressure. There's, um, you know, people have the entire season to make up uh, points to fall inside the top 125. I'm only getting 14 events, um, which almost seems like I have to make up the full amount of, uh, of, of points. Um, it's just, it's something that I'm aware of, uh, and I try to remind myself to just play golf, have fun, um, try to win a golf tournament, winning takes care of itself. Um, but at the end of the day, you know, I feel like I'm in a good place. My game's in a good place. And if I do it great, if I don't, um, there will be more opportunities and I will create my own opportunities, um, next season and for many seasons and beyond. Yeah. Yeah. There's a lot to look ahead to that you want to kind of plan for. 
Um, you did mention that it was a blessing in disguise in some ways because your daughter, Kylie, you got to spend a little more time with her with the injury that happened a few months back. Like, what was that like to be able to spend more time at the time she was four? Yeah, no, it's, it's um, definitely, we can look back and say that it was uh, probably one of the best years that my wife and I and our daughter have had um, ever in my career, you know, to be able to uh, visit family, to not have to worry about golf, not have to stress about golf. Um, you know, we're, we went weeks and weeks and weeks, maybe even a, two months of just not even talking about golf and schedule and where are we going to stay and what flights are we going to take and um, we were just kind of normal you know and, and I, I mentioned to my wife uh, midway through my injury I said this is what retirement feels like I mean are you ready for this you know um, <laughs> and so if the first couple months um, was good you know I, my wife and I were able to build our relationship a little stronger because over the years um, it gets neglected through traveling um, focusing more on my career and then her having to raise our daughter um, sometimes by herself while I'm while I'm away and so um, we were able to kind of reconnect um, our relationship is much stronger now than it was before uh, my relationship with my daughter has been stronger now um, because of uh, being able to wake up with her every night tuck her in bed and, um, and just play with her throughout the day and not have to worry about uh, not always constantly looking at my watch and saying, hey, I have, to, I have to be some more, I have to go practice, I have to do this, I have to do that, um, and just having to be able to focus all my attention on her. Yes, yeah, Kylie, because uh, she's about, she's five now, right? Correct, she's five, and now she's starting school, and this is a, the, the biggest problem that we're having right now is that um, now that she's starting school, she's not able to travel as much, and so what tournaments will she be able to come out to, and what tournaments um, will she have to stay at, at home? And, uh, you know, just looking at my schedule from that point, you know, they might only be on the road five or six weeks out of the year. And so have, being able to spend every day with her the entire summer last year um, versus uh, only being able to spend five or six weeks um, uh, during, during the season that is, uh, with her on the road, you know, it's kind of a big difference um, and just kind of makes me feel blessed to be able to have had so much time with her last season. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. Uh, um, you can't, you got to count your blessings when you have them for sure. Um, I got to ask you, so you, I'm sure you've been watching a little bit of the golf that, that finished up here, or at least been aware of what happened with the playoffs. What did you think of the playoff system there? They, they, they had their, the tour championship and having uh, obviously Xander won it, but then, you know, Dustin had the, the lead with because of the strokes he had going in. But what was kind of your thoughts on, on the system they had? Right. Um, they definitely accomplished their goal. You know, it was it's easy to understand. It's easy to know that uh, whoever won the tournament where J Dustin started at 10 under um, – and Zayner started maybe at five. Did he start at five or seven or? No, whatever? he was three. He was three oh, under. He was spotting under. the wow. hottest player in golf seven, seven shots. shots. Yeah. Um, but but by Sunday, you kind of knew like, okay, well, if Dustin's leading the golf tournament, um, having started so far ahead, that if he ends up winning it, then he wins the FedEx Cup. So I feel like um, it simplified a lot of things, um, but it did complicate the behind the scenes. Right. So um, something uh, such as official world golf ranking, you know, does Xander get the full official golf ranking uh, win or does Dustin get it? And I don't even think Dustin would have finished first or second. He might have finished third in that regard. And so does the official world ranking uh, differ? And um, had Dustin known that, like that, um, you know that there were maybe more points on the line through the official world ranking would he have tried harder on the back nine you know he like obviously he did birdie the 72nd hole to win the golf tournament but um you know was he really trying to make it for official world ranking purposes or was he like just you know nonchalantly just tapping it in and so um there's so many different scenarios and then you have uh the, the money aspect of it right and so dustin gets the full fedex cup win the $15 million. 
Um, but he also gets, I believe, and I, I'm correct me if I'm wrong, but he also gets the tournament win check, right? So whatever that may be, a one point eight uh, million dollars. But he didn't actually win the tournament. You know what I mean? Like he won the FedEx Cup, but he didn't shoot the lowest score in the seventy two holes. And so I think maybe if there were another leaderboard to say, hey, look. Um, Dustin, congratulations, here's $15 million, million, but you didn't actually win the golf tournament. You didn't shoot the lowest 72-hole score. That's what a golf tournament is. Um, and so that might be um, something to to bring up in further discussions. Yeah, I, I got you on that one for sure. Because, um, <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's always a, it seems like to be a work in progress, and they got a lot of it right, I think, uh, the tour did. That was one listener question. That was from Nate C on Twitter. Another question, you might recognize this name on Twitter, at J Swan, John Swan Tech, PGA Tour. You, you might know the name. Um, he okay. said, what, what is he more tired? What are you, James, more tired of talking about? The Gangnam Style Dance yes. in Scottsdale. Oh, already that, that one. Okay, yeah. John, we got your you answer. Have to go on. And it, it, or the sh shoe salesman in Nordstrom. Oh yeah, no, I I love talking about shoes, man. I I'm not a big shoe guy, but I love selling shoes. Was like another career, you know. It's like it it was something that I actually enjoyed doing, um, surprisingly, right? But it's um it's funny how now that I'm in a, a situation to where you know I I've made a decent career out of myself, and you know I feel very blessed to be in the situation where. Um, you know, I can travel the world and play golf for a living, but you know, there are shoe guys that sell shoes for a living. Like that's what they legitimately do to pay the bills, pay their mortgage, pay their electricity bills, pay their car bill. And so like, that was for me, you know, to put myself in that position, it was like a different career, you know, like I loved everything about it. Waking up in the morning, putting a suit on, um, selling shoes uh, in Walnut Creek. And it was, um, it was fun. You know, I was young. Uh, I had some really good employees, uh, that, you know, you ate lunch with and hung out at nights. And, you know, when you're closing down the shop or first thing in the morning at five thirty AM. Um, and so there were a lot of, uh, good memories there. The Gangnam style dance, don't get me wrong, was, um, also, uh, a big highlight of mine, but you know, it, I was telling someone the other day about the whole Gangnam style thing. It's like, you know, sometimes I, I, I remember the week after I did it or a few weeks after I did it, I was in um, the Honda Classic, you know, and I'm Friday afternoon, I'm going to miss the cut by a million. Um, and I bogey, I got bogey the 70th hole, you know, to go to like 50 over par. And I'm not just not having fun. It's a very tough golf course. And I, so I, I missed my par putt from 10 feet and I tap in for, for bogey. And I'm walking in my bag and a lady's like, you're the guy, do the dance, do the dance. And they're telling me to do the dance. And I'm like, lady, I'm 50 over par. I'm not really having that much fun. I'm not going to do the dance. Right. And so for imagine that for the next uh, seven years of my career where it's like, Hey, you're the guy, Hey, do the dance, do this. And I'm like, I feel like a monkey in a cage. It's like, Hey, I'll do the dance. Okay. Here you go. You know? Um, <laughs> but, but when I'm, when I'm having fun, with, I like, I am having fun with it. I do, you know, it is, I understand that we're entertainers and it's very entertaining. Um, and so I don't have a hard time um, talking about it or, you know, answering questions about it or even doing it. You know, I, I enjoy it. If it brings smiles to people's faces and, and they love um, that part of golf, then by all means, you know, I'll, I'll do the dance. You know, I'm, I'm good at dancing. I like dancing. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's, Interesting perspective. I, I get it, though. Yeah, you'd be tired of, of hearing it again from, from random people. Um, I, I got to ask you, I know we started with this a little bit. This is yeah, the safe well, way. Hold on. Let me, let me, let me, let me uh, butt in one more time. It's like, um, so we play the at and Pebble Beach. I play the at and Pebble Beach every year. And there's a guy that I've seen there every year that knows my pain. And it's the uh, I, Alfonso, um, the guy who does. Ribeiro. Ribeiro. Yeah, Carter, yeah, yeah. Carter, right? And so if you go up to him on any given day and say, oh, you're the guy, do the dance, do the dance, he won't do it. He's like, he's like, no. He's like, that's, 
I'm not going to do the dance just because you tell me to do the dance. So I went up to him. I'm like, hey, man, if there's anyone in the world that feels your pain, that's me. You know what I mean? Like, I get told that every time. Hey, do the dance, do the dance. And so we had a laugh about it. But, um, you know, but you see him on TV and he plays the, the golf charity event. Um, and he's having fun and he's doing the dance and he's having a good time and loving it. So there's like certain times that where it's acceptable. Um, but yeah, there's Fonzo, man. That's one guy that feels my pain or I feel his pain and we're on the same boat, you know. You guys, hey, it's a small brotherhood, but hey, I mean, yeah. you fit off in there. I got to ask you, you mentioned Ribeiro. There are so many people. I love that AT&T Pebble Beach because I'm from Sacramento, California. That's my one tour event that I can drive to, or at least was when, uh, back in the day. The people that we meet, James, in golf, and I'm talking about celebrities, I'm talking about friends you make, pros, who, whoever it is, think about some of the most rewarding friendships you've made from the game of golf. Yeah, um, right off the top of my mind, um, I think it's caddies. I think there are some caddies that I've made uh, some really deeper friendships than other players. It seems like, um, uh, granted, there are certain players that I, I've, I've made a really good friendships as well. I feel like um, the people that I've played with on the – nationwide tour back when it was called nationwide then it was called web.com tour now it's called the porn fairy tour uh, but when i had played it it was the web.com tour and the nationwide tour when i played there um i made some really good friendships um that i still have today that are stronger than any others mainly because we were young we were broke um, and we all had the same dream and um, graduating from that tour onto the PGA tour, I feel like we had an instant um, connection, something that we had um, that we were experiencing at that point of our lives simultaneously. We had just graduated um, to the big stage and had so much pressure our rookie year to keep our, our cards in which, um, you know, some people like Robert Streb and David Lingmurth both have had successes on the PGA tour and have won golf tournaments. Um, and then we all have uh, kids the same age. And so um, it kind of brings us all together full circle. Um, and now we're, you know, we're, we feel like veterans out here. And there's, you know, 22 year old kids coming out on tour and hitting a bias by 50 yards. And so we can all relate to that as well. Um, but those, those are the strong relationships. And then the caddies, um, I feel like have a, a genuine um, interest in, our lives you know they're granted they're you know guys that work for us um but you know they're i i i have the biggest connection with them because um you know having sold shoes at nordstrom and um knowing what it's like to not have a lot of money and to just kind of get by sometimes and um how life is constantly a struggle um you know i i feel like a lot of them are on the same boat. They might have been on tour for, you know, 10 years, but, you know, they might be kind of getting by at times. Um, and then they'll have a couple of good years. And so, um, you know, I, I get along with those guys. Um, you know, I, I'm not, I'm not the guy that stays at the Ritz Carlton uh, every week. And so I'll stay at the Hampton Inn and Suites so like, like I am this week. And, you know, I'll see some of the caddies. Uh, in a similar hotel and, and we'll, we'll talk and we'll, uh, we'll catch up a lot of times. Yeah. And I, I agree with you. I, I love some of the stories that you could tell with, with the caddies, so there's some really good guys who've been, I mean, bones and there's so, there's so many different levels of experience that they have. Um, and I think a Kurt who won on Cameron champs bag last year, huge win uh, for Cameron, of course, but for Kurt as well, that was a big one um, at Napa, the event you're at now. I got to ask you, though, about instruction. I know so many of my listeners are into um, what can we do better on the range? How can we be better prepared for our rounds? What do you think about the range session that we have and what we should focus on the most? Yeah, I was um, – I'm going to give you something different. I'm going to give you something um, that maybe they have or have not heard of um, on on the range. And – you know, I just picked it up this week. Uh, and so when you're, when you're on the range, right, like everyone's working on something, everyone's working on 
um, mechanics or distance control or, you know, just trying to hit the ball solid all the time, right? And so um, something that I came across this week that's been very helpful is competing, right? Like on the range, you're not competing. You're just hitting balls. Like if you hit a ball off a fence or over the fence, it doesn't cost you anything. You rake another ball and you try it again, um, which I think is great. But at some point, uh, I feel like competition makes someone stronger mentally and physically and really shows their true ability, right? And so, um, you know, if they're on the range with anyone, uh, it might be a friend, it might be, you know, a spouse, um, it, you, you might be there by yourself, but uh, it just competing, find a way to compete, you know, like, um, whoever can hit closest to this flag or whoever could hit their driver in between two targets and just, just trying to compete that way. I feel like there's a little more pressure, um, uh, especially if you're with a friend and you put something on the line like, hey, you know, we'll, we'll play for lunch, we'll play for a beer. Um, and I feel like that will make someone improve faster. And because, I mean, let's be honest, right? You can work on a swing um, mechanics for an hour straight and then you know I can come up on the range and say hey okay I see you know I've given you an hour head start um, let's let's put it to the test we'll go uh, first one to hit five drivers um, in a row in between two targets and you'll notice that their swing mechanics go out the window you know they're trying to get a ball to go into a certain target um, and so they either go back, revert to their old habits, or they'll try to make this new swing work, which then produce new habits, right? And so there's not, there's not really one swing that's like flawless, right? Everyone has their miss. Tiger Woods has his miss. Dustin Johnson has his miss, right? And so whenever you're making a swing change, you're going to have new misses, right? But you don't know what your misses are until you actually you put yourself in, in a position to, you know, compete and put it under, under pressure yeah well speaking of under pressure I know we a, a lot of us feel pressure when we're chipping once we get on the course like that's just there's so much nuance to chipping what would you advise with us with chipping yeah chipping um chipping's a tough one uh to be honest with you. you know I've gone through uh many tournaments many rounds where my chipping didn't feel that great and then there's rounds where I feel like I can get the ball up and down anywhere and so when I'm not feeling that great, I feel like um, you got to have like a, a, a go-to chip shot, right? So um, the one that you know will give you an opportunity for par, a good opportunity for par, um, but also something that you know you're not going to, you know, chunk or skull over the green. And so um, you got to have, you can't just have one method, right? You got to have uh, a couple different shots that, you um, you know, when you're chipping and you say, hey, you know, if, if you're feeling really good, like for me, I'll open up the face on a lob wedge. Um, I'll slide right under it and try to land it close to the hole and have it spin. You know, if I'm not chipping that great, um, you know, I might put it a little further back in my stance, close the club face or square it up and hit more of a, a bump and run shot. And so I feel like um, practicing everything equally. So that way under competition, um, if you are feeling great, if you want to chance it, if you want to risk, um, uh, you know, not hitting a, a great shot, then you go ahead and try to risk your shot. Or if you're not feeling that great and you're, you know, a little nervous, you're uh, under pressure, then just go ahead and put it back in your stance and just hit a, um, a, safe sh a safer shot. Mm -hmm. Well, speaking of safer shots, we all want to have safer shots on the greens when we're putting. What would be a good – kind of routine to get into before we get on the greens on the course with putting uh before you get on the green that's a that's a good one um, well i should say like on the practice screen what should we do on the, on the practice oh screen? okay because well I'll, I'll i'll go back for a split second is that before you get on the green there should also be a routine a lot of people get on the green and their routine starts and some greens are slanted this way and others this way and others this way. And by that time, you're trying to take in too much information uh, within, you know, that 40 seconds that you're allotted. And all of a sudden they hit a putt 
and they're 10 feet offline, they're like, what happened there? And then they step back a little bit and they say, oh, the whole green slanted this way. Of course, it should roll down the hill that. And so I think before, um, when they're walking up to a green, a lot of, a lot of the times, when I'm not putting well, um, a lot of the times it's because I'm riding in a cart and I just drive up next to the green and I hop on the green and I'm like, where am I? You know, like, what's going on here? But when I'm walking and I'm walking up the green and, you know, whether it's elevated, you can see the, um, the, the different, different funnels or the different tiers. You just see it in a different way. Um, I think that helps out a lot. You kind of see, see the ball breaking before you even get to the putt. And then when you get to the putt, it's more clear of like, okay, this putt's going to break this much um, or it's this much uphill. And, and you just kind of get a feel, a lay of the land um, before you even get there. And so I feel like that helps out a lot. When you're, when you're on the practice putting green, I feel like um, hitting three footers is, a, is, is key. Um, and hitting three footers in a circle is key. And mainly because um, on those three footers, what you want them do, to do, especially on the practice putting green, is have them going a little firmer um, and hitting the back of the cup. You don't want those three footers to kind of lip in on the putting green. You know, you want them firm, you want them in the back of the cup. Um, and the reason I say that is because if you go back another foot, or another foot to five feet or six feet or seven feet or eight feet, you know, you kind of have that visual of being aggressive and like hitting the back of the cup from that six to seven feet. If you're lipping in your three footers, which is good to also practice um, for speed control and, or if the greens are rolling 14, like they are um, some weeks, um, if you're lipping in those, you know, three footers, then from four and five feet, you know, it kind of, it, it makes you a little bit more passive in, in, in putting you know you're you're trying to make the ball die in the hole um, which might work again for you know Augusta Augusta type greens but you know for amateurs that are practicing on you know greens that are nine to ten on the stamp and they they limp in their three footers and they get to five and six feet and they can't even get into the hole they get to ten feet and they're leaving two feet short it's like well, what's going on it's like well let's let's start over you know start at three feet bang into the back of the cup bang into the back where if you miss, um, they they might either lip out or uh, they'll go two or three feet past. Right. A lot of the times, these guys will putt their three footers, and then, you know they'll go past the cup maybe two or three inches. I think that's not firm enough speed. Yeah. Well, that helps though for speed. That's just like what we need to have in our mind as we're on these screens. I'll get you out of here on this one. Do some quick rapid fire questions. I know you're a big sports guy. You love your Warriors. You love Bay Area sports. Um, what's your favorite sporting event you've ever attended that was non-golf related? Ooh, baseball. Um, I was at the game when uh, the A's won their 20th consecutive game in a row. And that was amazing. I've never seen the Open Coliseum so packed um, before it felt like a world series game, but I mean, anyone that's been to an open A's game, you, you get the cheap seats, the bleachers, the upper deck, and you can get any seat in the stadium. You can walk all the way down. There's nobody there. Nobody wants to watch a game on a Wednesday, you know, dollar tickets on Wednesday, dollar hot dogs. Um, but you know, that was a time when it felt alive, you know, like Bay area sports was back. Yeah, big moment there for sure. Uh, Moneyball, of course, they they made the movie about that. Um, I got to ask you, though, also, what about your favorite musician or artist when it comes to music? Um, I'm going to throw a wild card out there. I like, uh, I like J. Cole. I feel like he's just – he's raw, you know. He's um, – I like his style. I like his voice. Um, I like what he talks about. I like uh, – you know, it's not – this new music I don't get I'm 38 years old and this like whatever's going on the streets right now and people are listening to I don't understand but um you know I grew up on um some some Bay Area hip-hop and rap and you know they actually talk about real problems you know what I mean so J. Cole is kind of one of those guys that um has kept it true to true to hip-hop yeah what about movies? When you watch a movie, what comes to mind is really one of your all-time favorites? Um, 
Let's see something that I saw recently. Um, that uh, that movie with uh, The Rock, I think it's called uh, Shaw and Hobbs or something. Um, you know, kind of a spinoff of Fast and Furious. Um, you know, I, I like fast cars. I like action action movies, but um, I think The Rock is a really good action hero or action um, uh, actor. Right? I mean, the dude's like tatted up. He weighs three times as much as I do, and you know. Maybe in another life I'll I'll get as big as he is and and uh, and just like no neck right like that's pretty fun to watch on TV every once in a while but yeah that th those kind of keep me intrigued. What about like if you're watching shows like Netflix shows or something with Stephanie your wife or Kylie your daughter like is, is there a favorite family show or, or at least a favorite James Hahn show? So to be honest, like I'll get I'll be able to watch three minutes of sports on TV until my daughter just swipes it out of my hand. And now we're watching Peppa Pig for an hour. Like I have no control over the, what goes on on TV. Um, let's see for Netflix. Uh, something that we've watched recently was a new Mulan movie. So that's kind of welcome to dadhood, right? Like that's, that's, uh, that's my life uh, nowadays, you know, instead of watching the new, action movie that's just come out you know i'm watching the newest disney movie <laughs> instead great stuff man well hey always good catching up with you james and uh thanks for coming on beyond the clubhouse with me absolutely man thanks there thanks for having me Garrett.